Okay. So, just to kind of recap what we did for the first day of organic, we covered the alkanes. And remember, alkanes just means, you know, chains of carbons, or we saw um, some molecules that were actually in shapes, not straight chains. But everything we did last class, all of the molecules were all single bonded. And that is by definition an alkane. So what if it's not all single bonds? For example, if you have a double bond, it's not an alkane anymore. It's an alkene with an E. Okay, but the naming system is the same. You know, you still count how many carbons you have. Think about your prefixes. Meth, eth, pro, but, pent, hex, etc. Okay, the only thing that changes is that letter right there. Instead of propane, this is propene. If you have a triple bond, then it's called an alkyne with a Y. Okay? One, two, three, four, five, so pent, pent, pentine. What do you think, in this particular example, what is that two referring to? I don't have any substituents, so what is that two, why is it there? Triple yeah, to tell us the location of the triple bond. Okay, in this case, we would be numbering this chain from right to left because remember, you want if you have a number in the name, you want it to be as low as possible. Okay, so this is, is the triple bond is coming off of carbon number two. Now, go back to this one. Alkenes can have numbers in their names also. Why isn't this one named 1-propene. Why don't I need a number for that example? Yeah, if I, if I move the double bond over to the other location, that means I would then number my carbons from left to right, and it would still be 1-propene. If moving that multiple bond would not change the number, then you don't need to include a number. But, let's say I move that triple bond right here. How would the name then change? One pentine. One pentine. What if I moved it right there? Yeah, then I would start numbering the other way. It would still be two pentine. Okay. Yes, question? If we were asked to draw Mm -hmm. We expect them to be able to differentiate between having a triple bond coming from the left or the right. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Good question. Okay, so this is just a review of everything I've just said. Okay, it gets either the een or the ein ending. If your main carbon chain has more than three carbons, then you need to include a number in the name. Okay, if it's um, three or less, then you don't need to worry about it. Okay, here's just some examples. Now, first things first, what is on this slide, I want you to make a note, applies to alkenes only. Okay, what's called the cis or trans isomers apply to alkenes, things with a double bond only. Okay, and I want you to look at these two pictures. Okay, and remember, I said this last week, if when you're looking at a molecular, uh, an organic drawing, if, if the hydrogens are giving you a hard time and you're, you're not able to really see the carbon chain, then pretend that they're not there. It's the carbons that matter. Okay, so in the picture on the top, if you ignore the hydrogens, if they're bothering you, how many carbons are in my longest chain? Four. Yeah. Again, ignore the hydrogens if you like. One, two, three, 
for? What's the prefix for for? But, okay? And it would be butene, because there's a double bond. Do I need to include a number that says where that double bond is? Yes. And what would it be? Okay. 2-butene. Look at the one on the bottom. One, two, three, four. Two butene again. Can you see what makes these pictures different? Simply the fact that the carbon chain, the ends of it either are both on the top, or they, they could also be both on the bottom, either way. But this picture has one end on the top, one end on the bottom. Or we could flip it. It could have one carbon down here and the other end up here. That's the difference. And folks, if the ends of your carbon chain are both on the top or both on the bottom, that's called a cis isomer. If the ends of your carbon chain are on opposite sides, one on the top, one on the bottom, that's called a trans isomer. Okay? And I want to say to you that, yes, what's on this slide applies to alkenes only, but not every alkene do you need to think about cis and trans. Okay? If you're given a shape, a drawing, ask to name it, if only if you see this kind of X shape, that's the only time you need to worry about cis or trans. Okay? If you don't see it, that X shape, like, look at number one here, okay? there's a double bond, but is this drawing drawn out in that X shape? No, it isn't. So don't even worry about cis and trans. We're going to actually do numbers 1 and 2 together. If I don't need to worry about cis or trans in number 1, how would you name this one? Again, the hydrogens bother you, ignore them. How would I name this compound here? 1-butene. I'm actually going to change number two. I'm going to put a completely different molecule in there. I'll do my best to draw it well. So don't draw anything until I'm totally finished because I'm just making this up. This looks kind of strange, but again, focus on the carbons. We're going to talk this one through. Okay, I give you a drawing that looks like this, and I say, name it. First thing you want to do is find your longest chain of carbons. Okay, so I'm going to look and I say, okay, well here's one chain. One, two, three, four. No. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Is that the longest one? Okay. Let me circle it. I just find that helpful to circle where my main chain is. So seven carbons. What's the prefix for seven? Hept. Is it heptane, heptine, heptine? Heptene. Okay. The next thing to think about is do I need to include a number to indicate where that double bond is? Do I need to do that? Yes or no? Okay. And based on the fact that I want that double bond to be on the lowest carbon it can. 
should I number from left to right or right to left? Okay, left to right. Let me just write some little numbers in here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So, which carbon is it on? Three. Now let's think about cis versus trans. Which one is it? Cis, because both ends are on the same, end up on the same side. And there's just this one other thing to deal with. Do you remember the fancy word that means something attached to the main chain? It starts with an S. Substituent. Substituent. And how would we name a substituent with only one carbon? Methyl. Methyl. Okay. And it's off of the third carbon. And that is our complete name. For three and four, I want you to draw them. Okay. And remember, if I give you a name and say draw it, the easiest thing is to start with the longest chain and work kind of work sort of backwards through the name. And I'm actually going to give you a numbers five and six to try just to see if you're up for the challenge. Try these. And guys, I'm going to draw these out in two different ways. And both ways are acceptable. You choose which way you like better. Okay, because last class I was okay with when you were drawing things out, just drawing the carbon backbone. And if you're if that's still what you want to do, that's fine. But at some point you do have to start accounting for all those hydrogens. So I'm gonna draw them out in two ways. You choose which way you like better. draw them all out like that, or you could do this. This is a more shorthand way to draw them out. Okay, it's the carbons that matter. Okay, this is more the way you're going to see them drawn out on like multiple choice. But if something says draw, this doesn't even look like a drawing, but that is acceptable as a drawing. If you prefer this way, great. If you don't, then draw this way. And Remember, if you're ever confused how many hydrogens there should be, remember that each carbon can only have four bonds around it. Okay. So it's totally up to you which way you prefer. I'm going to give you two more here that I want you to try, a little bit more challenging. Try those two.
Okay, I skipped a slide when we first started this chapter that I now want to go back to. So let me get there. This one. Okay. It's just some very simple reactions that come up in an organic setting, and this is the simplest one. Okay. If you say that a reaction is a combustion reaction, what does that mean? Combustion. Correct. O2 oxygen is a reactant. And this is the simplest organic reaction because if any hydrocarbon, and I do mean any hydrocarbon, any compound that has carbon and hydrogen in it, any compound that is combusted, you get the same products every single time get carbon dioxide and water every time. So for this kind of a reaction, predicting the products is not the tricky part. The balancing sometimes can be the tricky part. Okay. Here's another reaction that you could see. It's called a substitution. And I'm going to draw this out for you. It's easier to see it. If it's drawn out. Let me draw this first one. Here's our first reactant. Added to something diatomic. And watch what happens. that hydrogen and one of the chlorines just switched places. Okay. Okay. A substitution reaction does not have to involve a halogen, but it usually does. Okay. One of a halogen switches places switches places with a hydrogen. Okay, that's called a substitution reaction. And then here is a third type, and I'm going to draw this one out for you as well. Each tick mark represents a hydrogen. What would you name, how would you name that compound right there? Butane. Watch what I'm going to do to it. This is called a dehydrogenation reaction. Okay. What got taken away from butane? Yeah, two hydrogens. And look what happens. An alkane turns into an alkene. Okay. Dehydrogenation just means you're taking two hydrogens away. Why two? Because hydrogen is a diatomic molecule. It occurs in pairs. If you remove hydrogen atoms, the product becomes unsaturated. Unsaturated means that carbon chain now has a multiple bond in it. If that's dehydrogenation, what do you think the opposite would be? If I turned, took this reaction and turned the arrow the other way, hydrogenation. Okay. If any of you um, do any kind of baking and you, if you look at um, the package of flour that you use a lot of times in baking, it'll say dehydrogenated flour. This is what's happened. Okay? One type of flour is hydro is has the hydrogens and one does not. Okay. So dehydrogenation, taking hydrogens away, hydrogenation, putting them back. This is 
the hydrogenation that we were just seeing. Okay? When you add hydrogen, or ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to see on the next slide, when you add anything diatomic, it doesn't have to be just hydrogen, it gets added across that double bond. Okay? But this one is specifically adding hydrogen, so it's called a hydrogenation reaction. But you could do the same thing. Instead of adding H2, you could add anything diatomic, and it will add across that double bond. Okay, it goes, it turns an alkene into an alkane. Halogenation just means adding a halogen. Now, let me introduce you to another molecule that comes up a lot in organic chem. Okay, this is a molecule called benzene, and I'm not particularly crazy about this drawing because it's missing something. So if you have the slides, I want you to add something to this drawing. It's a six-sided carbon ring, and on every other side, there's a double bond every other side. That's why that angle is 120 degrees. It's that trigonal planar shape. Do you guys remember the term resonance? Okay. Resonance, just to refresh your memory, okay, is when you've got a pi bond that is resonating between two locations. And what you end up getting is an average bond length between a single and double bond. That's what this middle one is showing. This is sort of a shorthand way to show you what resonance is occurring. And guys, because benzene comes up so much in organic chem, I guess organic chemists got tired of drawing this whole thing out, so they came up with a symbol for it. If we are doing something with benzene, it is perfectly okay with me if you want to just draw a hexagon with a circle inside. Okay? That's a shorthand, it's a symbol. If you want to draw this whole thing out, great, go for it. But this is totally fine. Okay? And benzenes very often do undergo a substitution reaction, but um, what I actually want to highlight on this slide is this word right here. What does the word aromatic mean to you? It smells. Okay. Benzene containing compounds very often have a very strong odor. So if you see benzene, I want you to think smelly. Necessarily bad smelling, but smell. Alright, and this is the last thing to talk about in this chapter. Alright, we've talked alkanes, alkenes, alkynes. We've looked at how to name substituents, cis and trans. The last thing to deal with is a group called the functional groups. Okay. These are things attached to carbon chains, but they change the chemistry so significantly that they're not even considered substituents. They are considered their own families. And to be honest with you, I'm going to cross out this first row, okay? Because I disagree with your textbook, all right? What this, first of all, anywhere in this, these charts, if you see the letter R, there is no element R. Okay? R mean, R is representing your main chain of carbons. And these are going to be things that are joined onto that main chain. Your textbook claims that if a halogen, any halogen is attached to the main chain, they are considering that a functional group. Well, I disagree because according to the rules of organic naming, halogens are treated not like functional groups, but like substituents. 
So if you ever see a halogen, and I'll give you an example in a minute, joined onto a main chain, I want you to treat it just like any other substituent. So let's talk about something that is actually a functional group. If on your main chain there is a hydroxide attached anywhere, it is considered an alcohol. Let me give you an example. Very simple. Okay. What's the prefix for three carbons? Prop. And they're all single bonds. So propane, propene, propine, what? Propane. And look at the ending. Propanol. That is the name of this compound. It is a three carbon alcohol. Propanol would be the name of that. Would you have to put the, uh, the number for where you attach it? Okay, no, you don't. You do not have to, good question, you do not have to include a number in the name to indicate where that functional group is. You do not. For any. Anything. For anything. Okay. However, what if I did this? It's not a single bond anymore, now it's a double bond. How would that change this name? Change the A to an E? Correct. And that's the only change. It wouldn't be propanol, it would be propenol. Okay. That's the only change that I would have to make. But that is an alcohol. Anytime you have OH, it's an alcohol. Let's look at the next one. Okay. A ketone. And for each one of these, I'm going to draw you out an example. Here's an example of a ketone. It's got a C double bonded to oxygen in the middle of its chain. Not on the ends, but in the middle. Okay, still three carbons, still prop, single bonds, so propan, and look at the ending. Propanone. Propanone. Pull this one up in a second, the next one. So we've had alcohols, ketones. Here is an example of an aldehyde. Very similar to a ketone. What's the difference? Okay. A ketone has a C double bonded to O always in the middle of the chain. That's what this is representing here meaning it's in the middle of your main chain. If the C double bonded to O is on one of the ends, then that is called an aldehyde. Okay, and here's how we would name this one. Prop. And look at the ending. Very similar to alcohol. It's not OL, it's AL, propanal. So, just to make sure this is clear, ketone versus aldehyde. Ketone has a C double bonded to O in the middle of the chain. Aldehydes are at the end of the chain. And that's what this is showing you here. It's at the end of the chain. And that, if you have that C double bonded to O, this is just a little extra information. It's called a carbonyl group. I'm not going to put that on the test or anything. All right, moving on, and let's make one change here. I've decided I'm not going to cover esters, so you can cross that out. I'm sorry I didn't make the change earlier. You can get rid of that one. All right, but let's talk carboxylic acid. Here's an example. Can 
you tell me what makes that this example different from the aldehyde we were just looking at? Yeah. The, okay, the C double bonded to O is on the end of the chain, but it's not just a hydrogen, it's a hydroxide. This is called a carboxylic acid. And this is how I would name it. Propanoic acid. Strong or weak acid? Weak. All organic acids are weak. All of them. Okay, let's talk ethers. This one's a little unusual. We've never had an oxygen in our main chain before. This is what ethers look like. Okay, this is the class of molecules that before the days of anesthesia, I'm sure you've seen, you know, a movie or something where, you know, early in the days of some, doing some of the very first surgeries, they would put this sort of cloth cone or mask over the person's face and they would pour a liquid onto it so the person was breathing in these fumes. Ethers will knock you out. Okay, so before the days of like intravenous um, anesthesia, ethers were used. Okay, oxygen is in the middle of the chain. Now what I want you guys to do is treat these two sides like substituents. How would you name a three carbon substituent? Propyl. How about a two carbon substituent? Ethyl. What comes first in the alphabet, E or P? Okay, E. Ethyl. Propyl. Ether. Two words. Ethyl, propyl, ether. You just name the other, each side. That's it. Okay, what, I'm going to make one little change to this ether and you tell me how the name would change. two of the same thing on either side. Hmm. Yep. Diethyl ether. Okay. Last one, and I believe there was a question on something related to amines on the AP exam, maybe? Maybe? I don't yeah, know. Was. Somebody mentioned it. Okay. Very simple. It just means on the end, your chain, you have an NH2, an amine group attached to it, and that YL means treat the carbon chain like a substituent. Meth, eth, prop, propyl amine. So, to wrap all this up, If I give you a drawing and I say, name it, first thing you need to do is find your longest chain of carbons. And the, probably the most difficult thing when trying to name a drawing is to figure out how do you want to number your chain of carbons. And that, what this slide is telling you is what things are the most important to have low numbers. For example, let's say I give you, and I'm going to give you this in just a second, a drawing that has a functional group, a triple bond, and it has a substituent group. And they're not all towards one end of the chain. They're sort of spaced evenly throughout. How do you know whether to number from left to right or right to left? 
Okay? Well, folks, if you see a functional group, like an alcohol, an amine, an aldehyde, a ketone, that is number one in importance for having a low number. If you see a functional group, that is going to determine how you want to number your carbons. Because this is number one, has got to have the lowest number carbon it can. If you don't have a functional group, and you don't need to worry about it, then you need to think, okay, do I have a double or triple bond? If you do, then that needs to have the lowest number carbon. If you don't have a functional group or you don't have a multiple bond, then all you have to worry about are your substituents. You want the lowest numbers you can get. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make some things up. I'm going to put up some drawings and I want to see if you could name them. And I'll keep it very simple. I'll just draw the carbon backbone. I won't worry about the hydrogen. Here's a functional group right there. That is number one in importance of being on the lowest number carbon it can be, so that automatically tells me which way I should number my carbons. Okay, let's do another one. Let's and don't draw this until I'm done, because I I'm just making this up. But the, if this, if that's a ketone, but the oxygen is not in the middle of the carbon chain. Yes, it is. I mean, well, there's not, but it's not like directly in the middle. It doesn't have to be directly. As, right. long, as, it's, as right. long as it's not on the end. Okay, okay. Not in that one where I stopped. <laughs> so if you see a functional group, you can right then decide how you want to number. Do you see it, Allie? Let's do one more. Doing that to mean that there is a triple bond on that side. Let's put a chlorine on there. Remember guys, halogens, you treat them just like like a substituent group, like a methyl or an ethyl, except you don't call that like chloral, you call it chloro, bromo, iodo, fluoro if you have fluorine. Try this one.
cyclo just means it's not a chain of carbons, it's a shape. Mm -hmm. These are called cyclic molecules. Exactly. Functional group is most important, and then I see I have a multiple bond, and that is why I numbered counterclockwise as opposed to clockwise. So guys, that's it.